Okay. The book of Psalms tonight, Psalm 63. Psalm 63. While you're finding your place there, I'm going to go ahead and lift, it, uh, lift up the sermon and the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, come before you tonight, Lord, and I, I just get, ask you to empty me of self, fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray that you'll speak to each and every heart through your word, Lord. I pray that this psalm would be a blessing tonight to uh, every hearer, Lord, and I pray that we get all we can out of it, Lord. I just ask you to take over now, have your way with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 63, beginning with verse number 1. <clears throat> O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee, my soul thirsteth for Thee, my flesh longeth for Thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see Thy power and Thy glory, so as I have seen Thee in the sanctuary. Because Thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise Thee. Thus will I bless Thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, and thy right hand upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. There, uh, they shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. As, as I was approaching this psalm, uh, really I, I feel like you could boil it down in about four, four different phases here, four different categories. Uh, you could four different divisions in this psalm. The first one I want to point out to you tonight is where he is addressing his enemies. Uh, he's addressing uh, the wicked. If you'll notice in verses 9 through 11, look at this. But those that seek my soul... So he's talking about his enemies there. To destroy it, uh, well, they shall go into the lower parts of the earth. That's what he had to say about them. Uh, uh, basically, uh, those that seek to destroy my soul, uh, he basically said, well, they're going to go to hell. And I'm not using that loosely. That's what he's saying is going to happen to them. In verse number 10, they shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. Uh, they're going to be destroyed uh, in battle, and uh, wild animals are going to eat their carcasses. Verse 11, But the king shall rejoice in God, everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. And here's the last part about, about these wicked men. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. In other words, he, he's saying here, there, there comes a, a day, there's coming a day where God's going to shut them up. He's going to shut their mouth for good. And so, division number one, or I'd say, you, you might say, uh, uh, the first category tonight, first, uh, the first point I would make from verses 9 through 11, is that there is a certain fixed judgment uh, for the wicked. For, for, for lost people. There's a, for those who die without Christ, for those who, who don't have Jesus, there is a certain fixed judgment. I mean, it's a sure thing. And people act like it's not a... They, they act like it's a joke. They act like it's uh, not going to happen, but it's a sure thing. Uh, I, I, I can't count how many times in the Scriptures that, that God... Uh, reaffirms the fact that there will be a judgment. I can't count the, the amount of times in Scripture that God reminds us that there's coming a judgment for, for those who are working wickedness and those who are, who are trying to do us wrong. And we looked at Psalm 62 
uh, just the other day, and you know he was he was saying in verse number three, "How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain all of you, as a bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence." They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. We, we, have, we have enemies, don't we? We have people who try to do us harm. We were just looking at that, I think, Sunday night in Psalm 119. That portion of Scripture was, I mean, uh, the, the psalmist was worn out by his enemies, and he was ready for the Lord to take action. But the Lord doesn't say that when He's going to take action on, on folks. He doesn't say when He's coming back. He doesn't say He doesn't give us definite dates or anything like that. He just He just promises us uh, there's coming a judgment. There's coming a day He will deal with wicked men. There's coming a day He will deal with lost people. Uh, one of my favorite verses I, I quote it often. I I I, I, uh, I bring it up often. Second Peter chapter three. You don't have to turn there, but uh, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so, the Lord is is uh, not in a hurry to judge these guys. He'd like them to get saved. It says He's not slack concerning His promise, and it's a promise of judgment. There is coming a promised judgment for those who don't know the Lord. And uh, it's it's a certain done deal. I mean, David knew it here in Psalm 63. He was, he was well aware there was coming a day that there was a certain fixed judgment. The second point is there is a certain fixed joy and glory for the saved. Look at verse 11. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. Uh, listen, we have we, we who have received Christ, He's our King, He's the King of Kings. We're told that we are made kings uh, through Him. Uh, but the King shall rejoice in God. We rejoice in the Lord. And every one of us, uh, we, we get to glory in Him. Listen, when we stand before, when we, when we go to heaven one day, we're not going to be glorying in our own accomplishments. We're not going to be glorying in our works or anything like that, we're going to be glorying in what Christ has done for us and the fact that we're there by the grace of God. We're going to be glorying in Christ. And so uh, there's a certain fixed joy and glory for the saved. You say, well, Brother Joe, I'm not really experiencing a lot of glory in my life right now. Well, it doesn't say you're going to in this life, even though I think we have plenty of reasons to be glorying in the Lord right now. I'm just saying there, there is coming a day you're going to experience joy and glory even if you aren't right now. If you're saved and you know Christ, there's a promise of a certain and fixed joy and glory for people who are saved. I, I don't believe Lazarus experienced joy and glory every day of his life either, but when he woke up in Abraham's bosom and the rich man woke up in hell and I'd have to say Lazarus was probably pretty joyful and glorying at that moment. So even if we're not experiencing it in this life, we are definitely going to be experiencing it in the next if you're saved. So there, th these things are certain. And that's what he's talking about in verse 9 and 11. Look, there's a certain, it's, it's, a, it's a fixed judgment that's coming for the lost. And it's a fixed joy and glory for the saved. The third division... Uh, I wanted to point out tonight, those were the first two that jumped out at me. The third, third division I would divide this psalm in is, I, I'm calling it the reasons for the psalmist's conclusions. The fourth division is his conclusions. He's, he's, he's reached some conclusions in this psalm, and he's sharing them with us, but he also explains why he's reached these conclusions, and that's pretty neat. He gives us two verses here, verse 3 and verse 7. They both begin with the word, because. He is explaining himself. He's saying, here's why I think this way. Here's why I believe what I'm saying to you. Uh, verse number three. Because thy loving kindness, because God's loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Because that, because of that. I mean, that's something that he's figured out, isn't it? God's loving kindness is better than life? 
Those are not empty words. Those, that's, some, that's, that's not something he's just going, boy, this chocolate cake is, is uh, better than life. Uh, boy, this, this pie is made in heaven. I will call it heavenly pie. That, that's hyperbole, right? We're overestimating that pie a little bit, even though it's delicious. I'm never wrong. Even though that chocolate's really good, you know, we're just, uh, boy, that's good enough. It makes you want to slap your mama, some people would say. That's disrespectful. Nobody should say that. But, uh, you know, they, they, they say things like that when something's really delicious, you know, and they're using hyperbole. He's not using hyperbole when he says it. He's not overestimating the Lord's loving kindness. He says the Lord's loving kindness is better than life. That's quite a statement. Better than life. It would be better to die than to be without the Lord's loving kindness. And to have never experienced it. It would, it, it would be... To, to not experience the Lord's loving kindness would be, would be worse than death. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. I mean, one thing you could take with that is, since the Lord loves us so much, uh, there have been Christians who have been willing to die for their faith. Uh, they know the Lord is love. And they know that they're going to be in, in instantly in the presence of love Himself. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, the psalmist has reached some of these conclusions. Let's look at a second reason. The second reason is found in verse 7. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Think about that, what he's explaining there. In the shadow of thy wings, the Lord has protected him at times. The Lord has sheltered him under his wings at times. Uh, the Lord has helped him in his times of need the psalmist has seen that happen. And so since he's seen the Lord's help and the Lord's sheltering and the Lord's loving kindness, he will praise him and he will rejoice. That, that speaks of the two things we were talking about a second ago. Joy and glory. Joy and glory. He will have joy and he will glorify the Lord. Because the Lord has helped him in the... Listen, we've got to think back to times that the Lord's helped us. We've got to think back to times where the Lord showed us love. We've got to think back to times where He's, he's come along our, our, uh, to our side and, and taken us under His wing and protected us. We've got to think about all the blessings that He's given us. And folks, those are reasons to reach some of these conclusions that the psalmist is about to point out. The psalmist's Conclusions. That's the fourth division that I would divide this psalm. Verse number one. Here's the, here's the conclusions the psalmist has drawn. O God, Thou art my God. That's the first conclusion. God, You are my God. I don't want any other gods. You're it. I don't want to have any other uh, gods before you. I don't want to have any idols. God, you are my God. God, since I've experienced your loving kindness, and God, since I've experienced your help, you are my God. That's the conclusion I've reached. You're going to be my God. Early will I seek thee. There's a second conclusion that he's reached. There's two ways to look at that, and I think they both apply. Early, well, probably first thing every day, we should probably seek the Lord. Early in the morning will I seek thee. But also early in life, children, <coughs> early in your lives, you should be seeking the Lord. You should be praying. You should uh, be in your Bibles. If you, if you have trouble reading your Bible, you should have somebody read it to you. Early in your life you should be seeking the Lord. Early will I seek thee. Uh, the next, next conclusion he's reached here, is he's made a decision to thirst for God. Look at this. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee 
in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. He compares this life and this world to be in a desert. To be in a desert. You ever experienced some really hot days? Some really dry days where you've been really thirsty? Where you've re uh, you know, uh, man, you, just a, a cold drink of water sure sounds pretty good. Uh, uh, used to used to do hay with Dad, and, and when we did hay, Dad would make this big jug of water, and it would have ice floating around in there, and you move that jug of water, and you hear that ice. That all sounds really good. You know, you're in your air-conditioned house, and you're making that, and it's all right and everything. But then you get out there, and you haul hay for a little bit. Probably about 20 minutes is all it takes. <laughs> you start developing a thirst. A couple hours into it, uh... You, you know, you'll, you'll give $10 for that jug of water. You, you'll give 20 bucks for that jug of water. You know, that thing is starting to look really good. You know, a few hours, you might get you a drink here and there. About four hours into it, boy, that, that water, uh, you could drink the whole jug. It, it's that good, right? It's that good. You're thirsting for it. Well, the psalmist says that's how we're supposed to be for the Lord. We're supposed to be thirsting for God. Like a... Like we would be in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. That's, that's how we should be deciding to thirst after Him. Listen, we, we need to be thirsty to see God work in our life. Look at verse number 2. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Listen, we need to be thirsting to see God work in our life. We need to see. We need to be thirsting to see God work in our prayer life, and in, in our in our ministries, and in our witnessing, in our families, in our home life, in our finances. Wherever the case may be, we need to be thirsting to see the Lord work. I personally thirst to see the Lord work in my children's lives. I want to see that. I want to see the Lord work in our lives. Uh, the next conclusion he's reached is a decision to praise God. Look at verses 4 and 5. He says, Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. That's another conclusion he's reached. I tell you, if, if God's been good to you, and you've experienced some things of God, He's saved your soul, He's blessing your life. He's working in your life. Listen, we need to be praising Him. The Bible actually tells us to praise Him for everything, not just the good stuff, but we, we've got plenty of reasons to be praising Him, right? We should have said, count your blessings tonight before we, before we got into the sermon. We should have sang that. That's the song we should have, just to remind us, right? We've got plenty to be praising Him for. And the psalmist has reached this conclusion. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. <coughs> the next decision, or the, the next conclusion that he's reached here is a decision to be content with God. He says, my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. Uh... The Bible teaches a lot about being content with things in life, being content with your bank account, being content with your, with your uh, marriage, being content with your children, being content with your job situation, being content with whatever the case may be. Uh, be being content with what you've got. Uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul said, I've learned in whatever state I am, Therewith to be content. He had learned to be content. And here the psalmist has too. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fat, fatness. We, listen, that's a, that's a good conclusion to reach about the Lord. Is to make a decision to be content with God. Whatever He does. Whatever He allows. I tell you, with our church, uh, sometimes uh, I have to decide to be content with what the Lord's doing. Uh, part of me is content, another part of me isn't. Uh, I want to see pews filled. Um, I want to see 
folks who, who, who come to one service, maybe come to the rest of the services, whatever, but, you know, I, I, at the same time, I recognize this is the Lord's church. Uh, every door that I've knocked, I want to see people come to church. Every, every, uh, every person that we've witnessed to, I want to see them get saved. Every person that we've tried to lead to the Lord, come on, come to Christ. Every person that we've invited to church, I want to see them come. At the same time, well, I could drive myself crazy if that's all I ever thought about or all I ever dwelled on. So I'll be content with what the Lord does. I'll witness. I'll plant seeds. I'll try to, I'll try to lead somebody to the Lord, get them saved. I'll invite people to church. But I'm also going to be content with what the Lord does. Does that make sense? And there's got to be a contentment there. There has to be. Because it's the Lord's church. Uh, looking back at, at, the, at the prophets and, and preachers in, in the Bible, uh, Noah preached for a hundred years. Some people say 120. Some Bible scholars say he preached for 120 years. That's a long time to be preaching. Some people don't even live that long. But he was preaching for at least a hundred years. And uh, I don't know how many people got saved and died before the flood. It doesn't tell us. But at the time of the flood, only eight people were on the boat. And that has to be somewhat discouraging. In fact, if you were Noah, you would probably be dwelling on that. You'd probably be going, man, why didn't so-and-so believe the message? Why didn't so-and-so respond the way I wanted them to respond? Why didn't so-and-so, why didn't so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so? And, -so and, -so -and, -so? and this person over here is drowning, and that person over there is drowning. Why didn't they listen? But at some point, um, Noah needed to, if he didn't do this, it's something that had to happen. He had to reach a point where he said, you know what, I'm going to be content with what the Lord did. I'm going to be content with, with the fact that those people made their decisions, and I can't make them for them. Hey, Brennan. No. At some point, Noah had to reach that point. There has to be a contentment. And here he says, my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. The next conclusion that he's reached is that he's going to focus on God all day. Focus on God all day. Verse number 6. When I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. Now he just mentioned in verse 1 that he's going to seek him early. He's going to seek him early. And here he's mentioning it's going to be at night too. Now, folks, I understand we all have jobs to do. Uh, Brother Pallone, you've got bread. Now, I would not have you uh, reading your Bible every, every minute of every day uh, while you're working that bread, okay? Don't, don't do that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to make a joke about Jason, but I won't do that. Is he doing okay, by the way? Is he hurting? Is he, is he in a lot of pain? He's supposed to try to get medicine today. Okay. Still waiting on that. I sure hate that he you know. That, that's no fun. But, uh, you know, we, we've got jobs to do. We've got, you know, people to interact with and things like that. So your mind isn't going to be on God 24-7 or anything like that. But, you know, when you're going through your day, you need to be thinking about the Lord. You know, I, I, would, I would encourage you when you get up in the morning, be thinking about the Lord. Uh, you might take, take some time then and, and get in your Bible. That would be a good thing to do in the morning. During the day, you're going to be working and doing things, but you can be thinking about the Lord during those times. You know, you can have Him on your mind. You can think about a scripture. Uh, and at night, He says here, when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Uh, the psalmist was meditating on the Lord, and, and you could make a case He was doing it all day. That's, the, that's another conclusion He's reached. A uh, couple more conclusions here. He's decided uh, that he's going to follow hard after God. Look at this, verse number 8. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. You know, that's, that's a good conclusion to read. That, that speaks of, of meditating on the Lord all day long and thinking about the Lord all day, all day long and you know, thinking about scriptures and let, letting them impact your life. My soul followeth hard after thee. And the last conclusion he points out here is also in verse 8. He says, The Lord's right hand upholdeth him. Listen, 
even in all this, he's talking about seeking the Lord early. He's talking about following hard after God. He's talking about thirsting for the Lord and all these things. He's also remembering, uh, without the Lord's help, he can't do it. <laughs> without the Lord's help, he can't follow hard after God. Without the Lord's help, he can't walk with the Lord. My soul, my soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. We need God's help. Even to desire and seek Him, we need His help for that. And so in conclusion tonight, I, I want to point these, let, let me conclude the, 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 this psalm and, and, and one final point. First of all, the first division, judgment is certain for the lost. Judgment is certain for the lost. Secondly, joy and glory are certain for the saved. Joy and glory are certain for the saved. Thirdly, the psalmist has reasons for his conclusions. Fourthly, the psalmist gives us a bunch of conclusions, doesn't he? A bunch of things that he's realized about life and about the Lord. So lastly, I want to leave you with this. If you don't get anything else, just I want you to get the main, I think the main crux of this, of this psalm uh, that David has given us here. We need to choose to desire God. We've, given, we've been given plenty of, op, uh, plenty of reasons here. We've been told what's going to happen to the lost people. We've been told what's going to happen to saved people. We've been told about all these blessings that the Lord's given us in our life, about His loving kindness, uh, about, his, about His help and His sheltering and His protection. We've been told about those things. So if I could encourage you tonight, choose to desire God. And if that's something you struggle with, if you struggle with desiring the Lord, maybe pray and ask Him to help you desire Him. Maybe pray and, ask, and say, Lord, will you help me to desire you? Will you give me a desire for you that doesn't go out, that doesn't go away? I'm going to ask you to take just a minute tonight, bow your head, close your eyes, and, and do some business with the Lord if you so choose. And choose to desire Him tonight and ask Him to, to, to produce a desire in your heart for him. The New Testament tells us, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Choose to desire the Lord tonight.